prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We ask that you wrap your arms of love around us as we as sisters of the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs Incorporated come together and join harmony to present today's workshop. Lord, we ask you to continue to guide us and help us with our mission and journey to invest ourselves in the willing service of others and to promote the interests of business and professional women. Lord, we ask right now that you guide and protect our presenter in providing us with the information that we need so that we can learn, grow, and help change our communities. These and other blessings, amen. On behalf of the Jasper, Jasper County, Broward County, Greater Memphis, and Vicksburg Clubs, I am pleased to welcome today's program on creating Black wealth through real estate. Our presenter is Michelle Merritt, CEO, broker of New Legacy Realty. The best way for us to tell you about the presenter is to ask her to introduce herself. But, uh, thank you. I want to thank Ms. Um, Barbara Johnson, Governor Barbara Johnson of the Southeast District for the invitation to come speak with you all. I've had the pleasure of attending two of your national conferences and one Southeast District Conference. So it's just been a wonderful opportunity to spend time with you ladies. And so I'm glad for this opportunity this morning. And I want to thank the Vicksburg Club, the Jasper Club, the Greater Memphis Club, and the Broward County Club too for your participation today. So again, we are presenting today. I am Cheryl Merritt again, New Legacy Realty is my company. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm a member of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And we have a pillar called WIRE, which stands for Women Investing in Real Estate. And that program started under our 32nd president, um, President Lydia Pope. She's out of Cleveland, Ohio, and she was doing workshops in her area with women. And so that's how this, um, this pillar was born. Um, we have created over the last two years, two reports called the Wire Report, Understanding the Landscape fa Facing the African-American Woman Home Buyer. And we are now in our third iteration, which will be coming out in 2024. We have two professors out of, um, out of Houston, Texas, out of um, two universities there who provide this report to us. And it's really comprehensive. It has a lot of information, particularly pertaining to women. So, um, just a little bit about the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. We were founded in 1947. We just celebrated 75 years a couple of years ago. And our mantra is democracy and housing. Currently, we have about 120 local boards throughout the country made up of real estate professionals and others who touch the real estate industry. So there's mortgage lenders, there are contractors, there are developers, there are attorneys. We just made up of a, a, a conglomerate of different types of um, professions. And we're known as realtors. I know most of you have ha heard of realtors. Um, if you're a member of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, you are also considered a realtor. And we maintain a high standard of professional integrity, as well as a strict code of real estate industry ethics. And we also have a, a proponent to work with our community. And our mom, I mentioned earlier, is democracy and housing. So right now we have five pillars that we're under. And this is so that we can know how to present to our community. So government relations and advocacy, that is one of our pillars. And this is in no particular order. One is, you know, just because it's one through five. The other one is generational wealth building. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, although it's under the wire pillar. But let me just read this to you that we are using these pillars to, to build Black wealth. So with government relations and advocacy, over the course of our history, there have been barriers to home ownership that have been identified, addressed, and eliminated based on the association's commitment to advocacy on behalf of equality and opportunity in our profession and for the Black Americans seeking home ownership of their choice. The second pillar, generational wealth building, NARAB understands that wealth building concepts, plans, and execution should be addressed on a multi-generational basis. In that regard, NARAB has developed age and lifestyle specific initiatives to reach and inform audiences about wealth building and home ownership. Our third pillar, faith-based and civic engagement. NARAB relationship with faith-based and civic institutions allows the association to target American consumers nationwide to educate our audience about home ownership and inspire them to purchase real estate. 
NASIGRAF strategic and MOU relationships will be nurtured under this pillar. The fourth one is diversity and inclusion small business. The majority of NARAB members are small businesses that qualify for most diversity and inclusion initiatives. We will focus our attention on education and informing NARAB members about the income generation possibilities available to minority certifications and minority procurement opportunities. And then the fifth pillar, WIRE or Women Investing in Real Estate. NARAB has identified Black women as a high potential target market group of consumers to reach and penetrate to focus their attention on spending power on investing in real estate and existing practitioners' careers in real estate. Okay, so that's those are our five pillars. And so the last one, the wire pillar, is the one that I um, represent, but we're also going to be focusing a little bit today on generational wealth building. So as I mentioned, we've identified Black women as a potential target audience. So give me just a second here. So, um, and the reason being is because Black uh, make up, when it comes to making decisions regarding home ownership, they, they provide 90% of, they make decisions in 90% of the household. Would you ladies agree? Raise your hands if you agree, if you make those decisions. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. We do, we make those decisions, right? And so our goal with WIRE is to increase access to financial capital for Black women, number one. Also, um, to increase home ownership and real estate investment for Black women. Right now, I don't know if you ladies are aware, but in America, in the United States, the Black home ownership rate is only about 44%, right? And the white home ownership rate is about 73%. So there's almost a 30% gap in home ownership just between those two groups. And then there's the Hispanics and the Asians who have a higher percentage. So we're unfortunately at the bottom rung when it comes to home ownership. Um, so that's why we are targeting Black women to try to increase home ownership with this group of women, as well as development of affordable housing for Black women. You are in, in um, um, Mississippi. Um, some of you ladies are in Miami or in the Florida area and then Memphis. Some of those areas have higher um, uh, African-American. I know I went to Memphis a couple of years ago. I did not realize Memphis had almost a 60% African-American population. It just, it blew my mind. And so where I live, we have about a, about a 25% African-American um, rate. But the point is, we know that affordability right now in this day and time is getting more and more difficult for African-Americans because the interest rates have gotten higher and the pricing of houses have gotten even higher. In my market, the average price of a house right now is about $430,000. I know, and, and so, and I'm sure in some of your markets, you have seen that increase as well. So we're trying to find initiatives to help people be able to address these issues. Um, if any of you ladies are interested in the, in the WIRE report, here is, is, you wanna just scan it. It'll take you to the report, it is about, I guess about a 30 page report. So if you just got some free time and want to do some reading, a little bit more about what's in the wire report there. So why real estate? Why, why do we feel like real estate is one of the ways that we can use to build generational wealth? Well, one of the main reasons is it's a tangible asset, right? It's something that you can, it's not like touch stocks you can't touch, right? It's something that you can touch, feel, you can see it. Um, your investment will appreciate over time. The studies show that over time, real estate increases in value at about 5.5%, and that's over the past 100 years. In my market, in Raleigh, our increase has been about 20% over the last two or three years. Um, just, and again, that goes back to what we've been talking about, just how pricing has gone up. And I'm sure in some of your markets, you've seen the same thing your investment can provide a monthly cash flow. So right there, what we're talking about is if you invest in rental properties. So just as a show of hands, does anybody own rental properties on this? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about, Ms. Barbara Johnson. <laughs> Governor Johnson raised her hand. I'm sorry if I can't see everybody's hand. But yeah, if you have rental property, you can have cash flow from that monthly income that you get from that, right? We also mentioned your investment can grow equity. Uh, a lot of people are sitting on their homes right now, not wanting to sell because of interest rates. But I think one thing that people are not um, 
recognizing or taking into account is they have more equity now than they probably have ever had since they've been a homeowner. And that's because of the price increases that we've seen over the last couple of years since the pandemic. It's a unique asset, right? You can leverage, you can leverage real estate. Well, how can you leverage it? You can use equity in your home to do other things, right? So if you wanna send kids to college, if you wanna invest in a business, if you wanna do invest in other real estate, you can pull equity out of your home to do that. And then the other thing is you may find a good deal in some markets, um, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, for one, I was, I was shocked. Our, um, we had our national conference in Cleveland a couple of years ago, and you could actually buy a house in Cleveland for like $120,000. And we were, a lot of us were just fascinated by that because in a lot of markets throughout the country, that is not the case. So. Sometimes you have to go outside of your own market in order to find some of these deals, right? So if you want to be an investor, you don't necessarily have to stay in your own area. You can look into other areas. So here, why real estate is so important to generational wealth, and this is very important here. Um, have a lot, there's a lot of economic value, right? Intergenerational transfer of wealth. And this time right now, we are seeing one of the biggest transfers of wealth throughout the country. Okay, there are a lot of people who have air property. Um, I personally have recently done, oh my goodness, I've sold probably eight air properties in the last year, right? Because, you know, somebody passes away, they leave it to their kids, their kids decide if they even want to keep it or if they want to um, sell it. And, and to me, there you have both options, right? Some people want to keep it because they either want to keep it as rental property. Some people may want to sell it so that they can take the money and do other things with it. But the point is, it has a lot of economic value. There's also tax benefits. Everybody who owns a home, you take advantage of your tax benefits, don't you, right? Because if you're renting, you don't have the same tax benefits you do as, you, as if you're a homeowner. So that's another major, major value when it comes to home ownership. Also, the accumulation of wealth. Um, in this market, I can say there is, you know, if you bought a house in 2004, 10, any time be between then, and you may have gotten a mortgage, put, you know, three, five, ten percent down. Now you have probably accumulated over a hundred thousand dollars in equity, at least. Right. And I tell people what you want to do to find out if you have what your equity looks like is consult with the real estate professional or you can even talk with your 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 lender to kind of get a determination of what your current home value is. And that is a simple, it's a simple formula, right? It's what my home value is minus what I owe on my house. That is how much equity you have in your house. So let's say you have a $300,000 value. You owe $100,000 on the house. You have $200,000 in equity. Simple, simple math, right? Um, and then that takes me on to the next, as, next thing, access credit building from equity, right? And then there's also the long-term savings that you have over the cost of renting. So although you are building equity in the house and you may not be able to touch it right now, that's still like money in the bank. Can everybody agree? That's just like having money in the bank because if you decide in the future that you want to access it, it's there for you. So economic value, the social values, I think, are really, really priceless, too. Um, they find, studies find that children feel safer and secure, and they do better in school when they have a home that they can go to. Um, they have fewer behavioral problems. And then you could also, when you're in a community as a homeowner, you have those social connections, right? I don't know how many people live in a neighborhood that has a HOA or a pool or a tennis court or anything like that where you can connect with your neighbors more because you have those things that you can take advantage of. Or you may have a park or other places that you can congregate. And that's the social value that we're talking about. So all those, those are some good things that are available when it comes to home ownership. There are still challenges, right? There are challenges that we face as Americans and particularly Black women, right? And one of the main, some of the main things are down payment. To get into a house in 2023, you, and it's, it's not changed very much over the years, but you have to have a down payment. Uh, the days of buying a house with no money down, they don't exist anymore. There was the time 
uh, back in the mid 2000s, but you know we know what happened in 2008-9 with the um, with the foreclosure crisis, right? So, but down payment has usually been an issue for a lot of women, uh, specifically black women. Um, and so there are, um, but but you need to know how much you need to put down. I think sometimes there's inconsistencies and people have thoughts that, oh, I need to save 10% or 20% to put down on a house to purchase. And that is not the case. A lot of times you can just put 3% down or 3.5% if you're doing an FHA loan. Um, there's also regulatory burdens right? There's, there's, there's policies that are in place sometimes that can keep us from ownership. Um, student loan debt has become one of the things that, that has been stopping people from being able to move forward because lenders are looking at your student loan debt and they are taking that into consideration when it comes to your debt to income ratio. Does everybody understand that? Debt to income ratio, what that is, is how much money you are currently spending and how much you have left over to purchase a home. And then adequate credit. Sometimes we're finding people don't have the credit. A lot of times lenders are looking for you to have at least three to four trade lines, right? So that could be a car loan. That could be two you know, credit cards. And that could be maybe a furniture loan. So they're looking to see that you have established credit and that you're making those payments on time. And we find that sometimes women just have not had the ability to, to get those credit lines established. Um, the other thing is once you get a home, sometimes it can be difficult staying in a home. I know over the last couple of years, this last year specifically, with inflation the way it is, some people have had a hard time paying their rent or paying their mortgage because they, they had to pay you know higher egg prices. You guys remember when eggs was uncontrollable and chicken was costing you almost $10 just to buy a pack of chicken legs? So, so the inflation has caused people to unfortunately get into foreclosure. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to have, have policies and, and direct people to resources such as our HUD approved housing counseling agencies so that they don't have to get foreclosed on. A lot of the states have these um, housing finance agencies and they've been given money from the federal government to assist people with staying in their homes. So if anybody ever is running into a problem with making a mortgage payment, know that there are programs out there through your housing finance agency um, in your state who may be able to assist you by, by making the mortgage payment on your behalf until you can get yourself back together. So if that's a job loss or you know if somebody lost a spouse, I mean, there's just a ton of reasons why people um, may be facing foreclosures. So just know that there's always help out there available for you. You just got to reach out, start with your lender, talk to your housing finance agency. You can always connect with a HUD approved housing counselor um, and also a realtor in your area. And then there's also societal challenges, right? Other responsibilities that we have as Black women sometimes keep us from being able to move forward with homeowners. A lot of women sometimes have help by co-signing with a family member, a child on other debt, right? So and let's give an example of me. You know, I have my own credit needs and I apply for credit, but then I have children, you know, young adults, and they are you know, like, mom, I wanna buy a car and they don't have established credit. So I may co-sign for them. And we found that sometimes that's a barrier for uh, to move forward with home ownership because not only do you have your own car payment, on your credit, but now you've got somebody else's car payment that you co-signed for. So the, the 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 nugget here is that you just want to be careful and you want to make sure that you have a plan in place that if you're going to move toward home ownership, that you find a way to, because um, what lenders will do is they'll ask you, you know, you may say, well, that's my son's car. I'm just, you know, I just co-signed for him and he's paying it. Well, then they will say, okay, well, what I need for you to do is show me where there is a 12 month history of your son paying the car payment and not you. And then they may be able to adjust it and not use that as part of your debt to income ratio. Uh, but the main thing is have a plan to get out once you know that you wanna to go towards home ownership, that you find a plan so that maybe getting that car refinanced in your son's name may be another option as well. But these are just some of the challenges that, that we found with um, that we've had to deal with. So NARAB has action steps that they are trying to put into place, okay, so that we can help people move forward, right? 
And one of them is what we're going to be talking about today is what we're trying to do today, I should say, is that's educate African women, African-American women on the economic cycle, walk them through the concept of equity building and how to strategize steps in the home purchase process, especially during economic downturns and things of getting to turn around, it seems like, um, when it comes to inflation and where we are today. Some of the other things we want to do is encourage Black women to buy sooner and smaller if necessary. And what do I mean by that, right? Buy sooner. Did you ladies know the average age that a Black woman buys a house is 44? 44 years old. Yeah. And so if you're waiting till you're 44 and let's say our counterparts are purchasing at 25, they've got they've got almost a 20 year. Uh, there are ahead of you on building equity and being able to build wealth, right? So when I'm talking about these things, I want you to think not just about yourselves, right? But also your loved ones, your daughters, your nieces, your your people in your church, because we've got to get this message out and let people know how we've got to change the narrative, right? We don't want women to be on average 44 years old when they buy their first house. I think I was I was 33, so I wasn't very young. I wasn't very old, but I was I was in my you know early 30s at the time. Um, but the reason we want to do this is because it helps you to build. If we're talking about generational wealth, we have to start sooner. We have to start earlier, right? Um, so, like I said, um, we're trying to reduce that number. Um, the other area is sometimes we we have uh, what do they say? Um, we have big dreams. You know, we want a house, but we want a big house. We don't want to start small. We want to start, you know, at 2,000 square feet. And sometimes, you know, those prices are a little bit higher. So we're encouraging people maybe look at something smaller um, so that it can be a little bit more affordable, right? Um, we're being cut. A lot of us are being cut out of the market right now just because of prices. I work with clients right now where I'm having to, we live in Raleigh, North Carolina, right, which is the capital and it's a big city. It's a mid-sized city, I should say. But because of the prices here being $430,000 on average, they're having to go out maybe 40, 50 miles to find something that's maybe in the two sixty, two seventy thousand dollars price range, right? So that's another thing. Sometimes people have to maybe move out a little further than they would have considered before. Um, something that I think is really, really helpful is down payment assistance. And um, we've got programs in our market that range from $8,000 all the way up to $50,000 in down payment assistance. But a lot of people do not know that these programs exist, right? Um, the housing finance agencies, the HUD approved housing counseling agencies, and the lenders are all aware of these programs, right? And so um, there's a, a NARAB has a partnership with downpaymentresource.org. If you want to take that down, downpaymentresource.org is a website that you can go to to find out if there's down payment assistance available. You can literally put the street address of the house inside of there, and it will tell you any programs that are available with regard to down payment assistance. So I highly recommend you either go to our NARAB.com page or downpaymentresource.org page to find down payment assistance. And then we've been asking um, for what they call special purpose programs. And these are that are designed specifically for certain groups of people. Now, there's been conversations about that's discriminatory, but when you've been discriminated, yeah, discriminated against for so long, it's not discrimination. It's, we, it's time for us to have something. So there are um, some banks out there that have, and I can't think of the name of the bank right now. I think it's BV, BVA. But what they did is they have created a down payment assistance program I think it's for $6,000 if you are an HBCU if from an HBCU. So these are just small things that we can do and that are being done in the industry to kind of help us African-Americans when it comes to providing funds to help with down payment assistance. So those special purpose programs are really becoming more and more important. And we're beginning to see more and more banks um, bring some on board. Um, Bank of America is another one. They have a couple of programs um, where they're providing up to $7,500. Um, there's some grant programs where you can get up to five and $10,000. So my point is that they're, they're, there's money out there for this and NARAB is on the forefront of advocating for some of these programs. 
some of the other action steps we're taking is um, we're trying to get more black female appraisers and loan officers and, and agents in, in the, in the game. You know, we know that if our um, home ownership rate is only 44%, we, that means people need to see our, and people in our community need to see more people who look like them. Right. So that they can know, Hey, these are people that I trust. We know that, you know, we want people to like, know and trust us. And we usually tend to start with our own. And if we don't see the people in our community, then we sometimes unfortunately don't know. So we're trying to increase those numbers. Uh, we're also sitting on decision-making entities uh, as far as you know, planning commissions, HOA associations, other boards in the community so that we have a voice and that we have a seat at the table. And then lastly, NARAB um, has to go out to our community and reach black women. So again, that's one reason why I'm just always delighted to talk to your group uh, we know you're a, a, a group of fantastic African-American women. Uh, we're also talking to faith-based groups, sororities, and other professional organizations. So those are some of the steps that we're taking. So what I want to do now is just kind of go into a little bit about um, the top 10 reasons why you should invest in real estate. All right, so I'm going to start with number 10. And the number 10 reason you should invest in real estate is it is something you can feel touching. I mentioned that earlier at the start, right? You can drive by it every day. You can see it. You can touch it. I know, and I'm sure a lot of you who are already homeowners feel the same way. I get the biggest kick when I walk out to my porch and see my little patch of land. It just gives me great joy, right? The pride of homeownership is, is, is to me is unreal. It's unmatched. Uh, we already talked about your investment will appreciate over time. We mentioned that over the last 100 years, there's been about a 5.5% every year, right? So um, we know within the last couple of years, that investment and that equity has been even more in a lot of our markets. Now, reason number eight, your investment can provide a monthly cash flow. We kind of talked about that too, rental property. You're going to have um, that rental coming in, that, that rental payment coming in. You can use the whatever is needed to pay your current mortgage, and then you can take the rest and you can add that to, to your own income, right? We talked about your investment can grow equity. Every mortgage payment decreases your principal balance, right? Which means you'll be getting that money back in equity when you sell or when you refinance, when you do a cash out refinance. And then some people can get what they call a HELOC, a home equity line of credit where you can get, you know, maybe $50,000 and you can draw on it as needed. There are a variety of ways that you can tap into the equity in your home. Number six, it's a unique asset. The old saying goes, God will not make any more land, right? We all agree with that. So your real estate investment is one of a kind. It is unique. There is no other piece of land like yours, right? Uh, and because of its uniqueness, properly structuring your real estate portfolio is essential. Um, so I don't own any additional real estate at this time other than my own house, um, but I do property management for quite a few um, clients, right? And, you know, I've got one client, he's an investor, and he owns 17 properties, right? So he gets a certain amount of money every month that's coming off of those rental properties. Every month he's getting money for those 17 properties. So it's always a good investment. That's his real estate portfolio. And most of them. And then of course there's tax advantages, right? There's in some markets you have tax credit programs. Um, you've got the mortgage interest deduction. They tried to take that away from us a couple of years ago. We fought very, very hard for them to keep it. Um, and then also there's tax deferment sometimes. Um, and when it comes to tax deferment, for instance, like if you're a certain age, in our, let me give you an example. In our area, because the property values have gone up so much, some of our people who live in the inner city are unable to keep up with the taxes because the prices have just gone through the roof. And so if you're 62 or older, they have a, a deferment program where they will defer your taxes until upon death and then the state can pay your tax. That's one of them, but they've got some others as well. So if you're in that situation, if you're a senior and you see that your taxes have gone up and you may be unable to pay them, you may want to tax, um, check with your city or your county to see if they have a tax deferral program. 
but there are many tax advantages when it comes to real estate. Number four, we talked about leveraging, using a relatively small portion of your cash. You can readily acquire all kinds of investment in real estate with leverage. You can do bank or owner financing, and this can multiply your return. So as I mentioned earlier, if you get a, if you get a mortgage loan at 3%, uh, on a two hundred thousand dollar house, that means you're you're only using six thousand dollars of your own money to buy a two hundred thousand dollar house. So that's the power of leveraging that we're talking about when it comes to real estate. You don't have to pay two hundred thousand dollars in cash for the house. You can leverage a down payment, and then you if you, if you have more money, you can use that. And I'll, one of the other things that we've been really trying to encourage, especially younger people. Um, and not just younger people, but younger people to do is what they call a house hack, right? So with an FHA loan, you can buy a one to four unit, right? You can buy a single family home, a duplex, a triplex, or a quadruplex. And if you are, um, if you buy a, you know, a duplex, you can live in one of the units and rent the others out, right? And what you will do is you would charge enough rent in those others so that it will cover your own mortgage payment. Right. And so we encourage people, if you are looking into um, purchasing and investing, that you may consider um, multi-unit properties instead of just single family housing, especially if you're looking for investment. And that's another way that you can leverage. Um, number three, you may live in a hotspot hot spot with multiple passive income opportunities. So you want to know what's going on in your market. And I encourage you the way you can do that is, you know, connect with the realtors. Um, and this goes into this, I'm sorry, my, my lawn guy decided to come cut the grass today. So I apologize if you, if you can hear that. Um, so you have help. We have experts that can guide you through every step of the process. That's realtors, realtors, lenders, as well as property management companies. If you have property that you need someone to manage on your behalf. And then the number one reason you should invest in real estate is you may find a deal. So there's always great deals out there. Um, the timing is right. And the, right, the reason I say the timing is right, because they say, don't buy real estate and wait, right? You buy, don't wait and buy real estate, buy real estate and wait, because the, the property is going to increase in value, right? We just talked about five and a half percent over a hundred years, that being the average rate, so buy real estate and wait. So the last thing I wanna kind of talk about and then we can questions and answers. And I don't know if we have any questions in the chat at this time. Does anybody have any questions? I, don't, I'm, I haven't been able to monitor the chat. So any questions at this point? We have two in the chat. Okay. Would you like for me to address those now? I'd be more than happy to. Cassandra Lang asked, this was back a bit, if your house is paid for, how do you determine an access equity? Okay, so that's a great question, right? So um, you can do one of two ways, all right? If your house is already paid for, right, you can either do a refinance to get the money out. You can sell it, which is probably not what you want to do, right? Um, because that's the ultimate way to get the money out. Or you can get a home equity line of credit. Right. So if you refinance, you would be refinancing what they call cash out. So let's say your house is worth two hundred thousand dollars. You refinance and you don't want two hundred thousand dollars. Right. You just want fifty thousand. So you apply for a fifty thousand dollar cash out refinance. Right. They give you the fifty thousand or you would do a home equity line of credit where there is kind of like a second mortgage, um, but it's an equity line of credit where they are giving you and you want $50,000, they see that you own the house free and clear, You've, it's valued at $200,000, you know, they have an LTV, a loan to value that they kind of use to determine they don't want to give you more than, you know, 70% or 60%. It's well, $50,000 is well below that. So you can do that as a home equity line of credit. So those are a couple of ways that you can access the equity in your house. Unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but the main, you know, if somebody wants to tap into all of the equity in their house, you have to sell it. But if you're just looking to tap into some of it, you can do a cash out refinance or a home equity line of credit. Okay, and the second question was, I guess, clarification on HELOC? HELOC? Yes. HELOC. 
And that stands, H-E-L-O-C stands for Home Equity Line of Credit. Yes. And so I usually advise people to check with their current lender. So if you if you have a loan, check with them. If you don't, if your house is free and clear, like the um, first person asked, then you can bank or either use the bank that you currently bank with to see if they have home equity lines of credit available. Okay, that's it for the chat and we'll take more later if you like. Yes, ma'am, thank you. All right, so, um, so one of the things I wanted to share too is that NARAB is on a Building Black Wealth Tour. We, the picture you see here, this is our national president up front, um, Dr. Courtney Johnson Rose, and then, oops, I'm sorry. And then we've got um, some of our vice presidents. And this is us, we were in, at the Congressional Black Caucus in September, and we signed some MOUs with Phi Beta Sigma, Delta Sigma Theta, um, the, um, uh, National Black Lawyers Association, the African American uh, Mayors Association. So this is a group of, uh, this is one of the pictures that we took because we are about to launch and we've already launched. With, and what you see here is um, a multi-year 60 city black tour. Well, that's actually increased to a hundred cities now, a uh, hundred cities. And we're coming to a city near you too, I promise. And so we're really excited about the Black Wealth Tour. Um, we, like I mentioned, we are um, partnering with National Bar Association, and that is the Black Bar Association they were established in 1925, as well as AMA, which is the African American Mayors Association. They were established in 2014. Did you know there are over 500 Black mayors in the country? 500. I did not know that. So we have a MOU with them, and they are two. These are two of our partners who are going on these Black um, um, Building Black Wealth tour with NARAM. And so what are we doing on the Black Tour? And these are the tour dates right here. So we've already been to Houston. We went to Houston in October. They had over a thousand people participate um, in the event. In Birmingham, they had over a thousand people participate in the event. Um, we're coming to Charlotte, North Carolina next where we'll be hosting our region, excuse me, not our region, but what we call our midwinter conference. And then you see some other dates, but where you see Mount Vernon, New York, April 13th, as part of our Realtors Week um, activities, we have over 100 chapters and 100 markets who will be hosting community days as part of the Building Black Wealth Tour. And then we'll also be hosting one virtually on that day. So we are gonna be reaching a lot of people. And the reason we wanted to do this is um, we wanted to reach as many people as possible in one day, right? And so on April 13th, that is the day. Um, and you see the other days, this is a two year tour date. We've got some others coming up later in August. And then you see, we've got some, I think we're gonna be close to, to the ladies. Uh, well, you see Atlanta, November 9th, 2024. I know we have some people from Atlanta on the call. Miramar, Florida in March, 2025, right? So those are some of the tour dates that we have in addition to the other hundred markets. Um, and I did look and see, um, Jackson, Mississippi, we're going to be there April 13th, and we're going to be in Memphis April 13th, and um, Miami. So um, so what will you learn at, and so I want you, the reason I'm bringing this up, I really want you ladies to get connected and stay um, connected as we move through our Building Black Wealth Tour, because there's a lot of information that's going to be given, um, and here's just a, a, and I'm going to highlight these, right? State of Housing in Black America, SHEBA. That's our report that we do once a year. We were doing it at the Congressional Black Caucus every year, and we just decided to do it in our own fashion. So we've been doing it on the campuses of historically Black college HBCUs. So we're really excited to do that. But what it is, is an overview and a ringing of the alarm for the Black community. We also do uh, a session called What to Do with Big Mama's House. And this session focuses on estate planning and passing along real estate. So you get a little, a real good uh, feel and instruction and guidance on what you need to do if you get Big Mama's house, right? Um, we do a college youth session. It's an actual play that our um, second vice president, um, Danny Felton, out of he's out of Florida. Uh, he created this play called um, Build It, Keep It, and Pass It On. And so they've been doing that play on the campuses of um, these, these um, HBCUs. Uh, investing in real estate. Any anybody ever heard of Airbnb? 
Yes, Airbnb is a big, they're one of our big, we've been doing some work with them. So they talk about how you can invest uh, and use your house for Airbnb. Um, credit, understanding your score. We know credit is important. You can't even get a job almost today or get utilities without having, you know, good credit. So we want to make sure you know what that is and how to maintain a good credit history. Uh, we do a ABCs of home buying, and that's one of the presentations that we do as well, step-by-step -step session on home buying, the, real, the role of the real estate professional, talk about the loan process with the lender. Uh, we have a session that talks about careers in real estate. Um, what we just talked a little bit about, I have equity now what? A class for sellers, existing home buyers, or homeowners to discuss the pros and cons of reverse mortgages and HELOCs. And I didn't talk about the reverse mortgage, but let me talk about that right now. Um, I used to be a reverse mortgage counselor, um, and reverse mortgages are available to um, homeowners who are 62 years and older, right? And a reverse mortgage is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a backward mortgage. So if you get a mortgage now, you're paying your mortgage payment every month and your balance is going down. A reverse mortgage is the opposite. You can get a reverse mortgage. You have a house. They look at a certain percentage of that. They pay it off. They pay off your current mortgage. Now you have a loan. You still have a loan. You're not making a payment on it, though. You have a loan. It's building over time. There's an interest rate tied to it, but you don't have to make a mortgage payment. It's just creating. It's just growing over time. And then you have the ability to leave the property to your heirs. And I always advise people to have conversations with their children because somebody is going to have to get a new mortgage because once that person passes, if they're leaving it to their family members, somebody has to get a new mortgage on it, okay? But what we find is that the 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 uh, a lot of people don't know about reverse mortgages. Some, it has a bad stigma attached to it. It is one way, especially for older people. As you get older and older, you may not want the burden of making a mortgage payment. So this is one way that you can kind of eliminate that. The person is still required to make their taxes and insurance payment but that's a lot less than a mortgage payment. <laughs> so something to definitely consider. So we do have a, a class on that. I have equity now what, excuse me, and they talk about the, the pros and cons of the reverse mortgage and the HELOC. Um, we have other areas that we talk about. They gave the example here in New Orleans, they'll be doing a session on property insurance. That's something that's a big challenge in that city. And then of course, a class on down payment assistance options. And we kind of talked about downpaymentresource.org being one place to, to go to find information. And so that brings me to the end of my presentation. I wanted to leave some time for some additional questions and conversation. And um, thank you for um, listening. And I hope you got out of what I had to say. Um, I think it's really important for us to, you know, know how real estate and how you know, we can build generational wealth using real estate. Um, and again, like I said earlier, not just for ourselves, but as we talk about these things, we want to talk, think about our daughters, our nieces, our cousins, our church members, because we've really got to let people know where we are and what, it, what some of the steps we can take so that we can build generational wealth for our community and ourselves. Thank you. Carol, before we open with questions from um, our guests, there was one final question in the chat about the tour. Specifically, are there any plans to visit Memphis, Tennessee? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Memphis. And uh, let me, yes, Memphis is on the list. Yes, yes, yes. Memphis is, hold on one second, because I thought, uh, hold on one second. Yeah, Memphis, yes, Memphis is on the list. Yes. So Memphis will be, let me see if I, I think it is, I'm pulling up on my phone. Give me just a second. Yeah, so Memphis will be on Memphis, Tennessee. This is in alphabetical order, so give me just a second. Yeah. It, it, um... Yeah, so Memphis's will be held on April 13th, along with the other 100 chapters. Yes. NARABBLACKWEALTHTOUR.COM. And that's where you may be able to put in your email address so that you can continue to get information or you can check there from time to time. What usually happens, because what usually happens is our local boards, they will, they're in the process of finding a location for their event. 
and then they will put where the location is and then that will be published on the site. So as of today, there is there, there are no locations that I've seen on the site, but if you'll go to NARAB Black Wealth Tour, let me make sure I'm giving you the right one. <laughs> I just had, I'm sorry. NARAB Black Wealth Tour, yes. I just had on my last slide. Yes, NARABBlackWealthTour.com is the website. And if you go there, you can scroll and you can see the cities that it's coming to. Um, yeah, I showed you the tour list, but then the other cities on April 13th, there's a whole list of them. And that's what I was looking at on my phone. And like I said, in um, they're, they're coming all throughout there. As far as Florida, they're going to Jacksonville, Tampa, Navarre, Miami, Orlando, and Tallahassee. So they'll be in a whole lot of cities in Florida. Um, Georgia, they're going to be in Atlanta and um, in Mississippi, they are going to be in Mississippi is MS. They're going to be in Jackson only on April 13th. And um, we have any other, we have Mississippi, Tennessee, Florida. Okay. Yeah. So those are the places. And did we have another, any other questions? I'm sorry. I just saw that one once. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Here. I know for a lot of people that I know that have started out looking for properties um, who've never owned a home, but wanting to start off with income properties. And I saw, you know, one of the notes is if you can buy sooner and buy smaller. And we know in the areas where I am, there's kind of rural, small town. A lot of those uh, properties have damage or need repair. Is it still a good idea to get what you can get or to wait for you, for you to find something in better, I guess, condition so that you can get it, uh, making an income? Yeah, so one, so that's a great question. Um, I don't tell people just to settle just for anything, just, just so you can buy it. But there are some programs and loans out there that are um, may be able to renovate the property. So like, for instance, FHA has a 203K loan that will provide you know, uh, an inspector to go out and identify what, or contract, I should say, to go out and identify what's needed to be fixed in the property. They will give an estimate and then they can get a loan that will include those funds to have that work done. So if somebody is interested in buying something that is not in moving condition, then they just need to speak with a lender who may be able to provide them with a, a loan product that can assist them with getting a house that needs to be fixed. Um, so that's my recommendation there. Don't just settle for anything. If you're going to look at a fixer upper, then get a loan that allows for you to fix it up <laughs> so that you can, you know, maximize your 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 living there. Um, you know, you can you can live in a you know good, clean, decent housing. Okay. And to be correct, you cannot use first time home buyer loan on income properties. Is that correct? That is correct. You cannot. It's considered if you're an investor, if you're truly investing, um, you cannot. Um, but let me let me put it this way: there are some, um, not necessarily called a first-time home buyer program, but there may be some programs that allow for investment. Let's say, for instance, a, a credit union. Our credit union where I live, they allow you to buy investment, and you don't have to put twenty percent down. You can put ten percent down right, versus 20, or there may be even somewhere you can put less, but that requires you chatting and having conversations with different types of lending institutions. Not hard money, not that kind of loan, but checking with maybe a credit union or a lender who specializes in investment property who can kind of guide you as far as what types of loans are available, um, especially with the lower down payments. I have been, uh, we do a lender panel almost one um, I do know that a lot of the lenders are looking, especially in this in this climate, you know, they've been looking for even more down payment when it comes to investment properties. But I too know that sometimes these credit unions have, you know, better options. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I um this is Governor Johnson or Barbara Johnson. I want to bring it bring to the membership and the people who are on our call today or our Zoom today that the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women are in partnership 
blessed with NARAB. And uh, we feel very blessed and um, very, very blessed to have Cheryl with us today. And hopefully we can expand on this. And uh, you have to go out and tell everybody how wonderful she is. And her presentation was phenomenal. And so that we can bring her back and we can get more information about um, about real estate and black wealth. So um, that's what I have to say. Uh, I always enjoy hearing her speak. She always brings something to the table that is um, and very knowledgeable. So I'll go back to the questions now. I just wanted to say that in case I had to get off for some reason. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I Thank you so much. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So it only remains if people want to come off of mute and ask them or allow our host to close. This is this is Christine Lloyd Burks with the Greater Memphis uh, Area Club chapter. I would like to say to you, ma'am, that you have made some things that I have asked questions about and people could not explain it crystal clear in an hour. Wow. Uh, I do appreciate I do appreciate uh, this presentation and I thank I thank you for this information. And I'm just thinking about my nieces and my great nieces and all that is trying to get them the information about buying while they're young. Uh, and I thank you in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I promise you, I will have all family members there. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. We huge. We have a huge uh, local board in Memphis, Tennessee. So I promise you, if you get involved, if you go to their event, you will be more than overwhelmed because they have a great um, local board there in Memphis. You have to be a, a broker or real estate um, uh, business owner to become a member of your organization. You do not, no. So we we have seen, we've had florists to become members. We've had, um, you know, people who not necessarily touch the real estate industry, but the majority of us are either a real estate professional, a mortgage lender, a general contractor, a developer, you know, so that's the majority, but we do have, you know, our membership is kind of open. We don't, we don't um, necessarily discriminate if somebody's not in the real estate field itself, but most of them do touch it in some way. So I just like to say, I know we're running on time, but I personally, again, just want to thank Governor Johnson and the entire um, Southeast District and the ladies here from these different clubs for the opportunity to speak to you today. I, I Like I said, I love your organization. I've attended a couple of your conferences and I just, I'm always honored to speak to you and to, you know, just hear the enthusiasm um, once we, you know, you know I'm telling you, I've been to some conferences of yours and people, they literally lined up to come ask us questions. And so, you know, I think the partnership is 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 totally beneficial, not just to us, but uh, just to you, but to us as well. So we just want to thank you again, uh, Governor Johnson and the entire um, club for your for your for your um, for your partnership. And we would like to invite you to join us um, as a member anytime you want to. I know. I keep telling Governor Johnson I will join I, as an at-large member. There's not one in Raleigh. There's one in, is it Greensboro, Reedsville? Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I've told her that I, I do want to join. I really do. I, I, I love you. I love you ladies. <laughs> so thank we you. We love for you too. And uh, we look forward to that. We're establishing some um, additional clubs in your area. So we'll talk. And yes. I think um, as far as I'm concerned and if everyone else is ready, Linda, we're back with you. Okay. Thank you all for your participation. And again, thank you, Ms. Mary. That was a great presentation. I really learned a lot and I can't wait to pass it on to my family and my young daughter. Um, it was an awesome presentation and great information. And that will be all. And I um, hope everyone have a great day and happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays, ladies.
Thank you. Thank Great you. job, Linda. Thank you, Ms. Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.